Now, I just want to back up what Debbie said about, from her children's story about the um, about prayer. Because we mentioned about James being um, known as old camel knees. So I was wondering how our knees are going this week. Are they getting any more calloused? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good habit to be on your knees. So, so let's, with that thought, let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, we open our hearts, Lord, to you. We confess that we have sin in our lives and we hand that over to you now as we prepare to listen. Help us to be aware of your spirit moving and speaking. And I pray you give me the words and um, all of us the listening ears to hear and not just hear but to do as you tell us today. So I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so yeah, the book of James, we've been one message into it. So this is the second um, from in, the, in the first chapter there. So the, the general idea today, we've, we've called it being and doing. I haven't written that on the first slide there, but if you've got your sheet, it's got being and doing on there. Um, it's a double-sided sheet this week, so that's why I could make it bigger. You can read it, hopefully. So um, just being and doing, there's been discussion amongst a few of us um, particularly two guys who aren't here today, actually, Brian and Sam, and asked about, about the idea of being and doing, and, and do we get the balance right? So let's, uh, just as we begin, let's talk about what, what do we mean by that, what, what's being and doing. So let's explain that as the idea that there's kind of a tension between the two, of being and doing. Um, I'll, a little later I'll describe it also as a cycle, but hopefully you'll understand the, this more than one way, is to, one way to skin a cat, I suppose. But at this stage, we'll just look at it as a continuum. And on one end is doing. That's where there's action. And so you're taking on responsibilities. You're keeping yourself busy. You're being a hard worker. And it's not just in spiritual matters, but generally as well. Um, and in our lives today, often there's little time to think about the next thing that's going to happen before we even finish the thing we're doing now. Uh, you know, the next thing's already overdue before the previous thing's finished, but so this doing is where we focus on the detail in life. It's the meeting the needs and completing tasks. That's the doing. The being on the other, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, you can think of that more as like rest and replenishment, uh, where you have you're planning, planning about what you are going to do, and, and spiritually it's really concentrating on the sustenance uh, from God through prayer and his word. Really, that's the, the key part of it. And it's honest self-examination too. The scripture does tell us to examine ourselves. So here we focus on the bigger picture, I guess. You sort of step back from the hurly-burly and we, and, uh, we allow God, whose spirit lives in us, to, to reshape and grow our faith. And it's kind of like what I was saying last week about the faith circle growing. So you know, both ends of this spectrum are important to God's work in the world. And too much of either can hinder our effectiveness. You think of it sort of like if you're in an army, I like to use army analogies sometimes, Paul often does. If you spend your time, all your time in the battlefield and never listening to a commander or anyone in, in, um, senior to you, you often end up just drifting into pointless battles or even getting in the way of your fellow um, you know, military guys. And you can, so you can even be a hindrance to the rest of the forces because you're, you're getting in the way and the, that's, so that, the problem with that is that you're all doing, all action and no being. You're not thinking about what you're supposed to be doing. But on the other side, if you spend all your time just consulting with your commander and you're um, sitting there discussing strategy and, and never actually getting your hands dirty, never getting out in the field, you're also wasting resources as well. So that would be all being and no doing. So we all need to remember we're in a battle with spiritual forces uh, and that we need to balance our time between the being, um, talking to the commander and, and the doing where we replenish, replenish our supplies and we, and we head out and engage in the detail and the demanding tasks of our lives and of making disciples spiritually and, and re- representing our commander faithfully. Now, I mention this because I think it provides a good backdrop, this, this idea of being and doing and getting the balance right, to um, help tie together what James has to say in this next little section in his letter. 
Um, and I've got it in three sections there. You can probably follow along as we go. The first one in verses 19 to 21 is about good living from a good source. Um, the second from 22 to 25 is about being and doing. Um, that's where we look into the word that God has implanted in us and we pay attention to it so that it changes our behaviour. And then the third section, 26 and 27, is about the true religion where James discusses some of the ways the fruit of our actions can be seen. So let's look at verse 19 now. He says, There know this, my beloved brothers. So this is ESV, my um, version I'm using at the moment. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. Now, as we've often heard quipped in life, we've got two ears and one mouth. So I think God's given us a biological predisposition to, to listening. I think it's trying to give us a hint there. So uh, I know for myself, and a lot of what I'm going to say today is directly at me, so I hope, hope that helps you as well. But um, you need to remember that when we're just talking with people sometimes, you know, how we sit there lining up in our mind the next things we want to say about ourselves and when we're supposedly listening. Um, so it helps us to remind us we can instead focus on the person themselves and really try to understand what they're saying and, and allow our responses to be in response to their, what they say so that it's not so much your agenda that's being followed, it's, it's theirs. Now this is a loving response, I think, because it silently communicates to the other person that, that their um, opinions and values are, are important and their stories matter. Um, and of course, these are guidelines, but not hard and fast rules. I, th- I think you'd agree we all could stand to be more like that, trying to um, engage with other people and, and being loving in your response to them. And next we're told to be slow to anger. And in fact, he goes on in verse 20 to give the reason for that. So verse 20 says, For the anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Anyone ever yelled at your phone? Or bang the phone down. Well, the old days it was really good. You could really bang it down, but it doesn't quite work when you just got to push the button. But anyway, so it's, it's certainly an easy emotion to fall into, anger. Um, so when you're tired or stressed or things haven't been going your way, but that never happens to anyone, right? No? No, we're, we all have that. So James doesn't tell us never to be angry, but just to be slow to anger. Because we are always well reminded by many people, and especially those who often try and discredit Christianity, that Jesus got angry. I've had that told me. Don't forget, he got angry, like as if that's automatically bad. And and others note that Ephesians 4.26, Paul writes, in your anger do not sin. So um, the thing is, most anger around us, we see around us, is not good anger. Um, And in ourselves, is not good anger. But... What we get from Paul and James here is that good anger is possible at least. So when he says to be slow to anger, he means probably really to actively bear with other people. Um, Others have failings and we all have failings and we've got to bear with each other. And remember we're all sinners as well. There, There is righteous anger, but that is the kind of anger Jesus had at sin and willful unrepentance, especially you'll see a few... I think Matthew 23 is a good one. A good example is really getting into the Pharisees because of things that made him angry in the right way. But the kind of anger where we sort of flare up and lash out, um, we have like, inflammatory comments, uh, or we're plotting revenge or something like that, where it's clearly not from God. So just think of the fruits of that kind of anger. Um, and we see it all around us. We have it in our homes. We have it... See it on the news, and I'm thinking the Middle East here, you know, a bit of revenge going on back and forwards. And we, we have it in our workplaces. Revenge just breeds revenge, and eventually just becomes natural part of your thought process and part of the culture. And those caught in it can't see any other way to think, so we need to break that cycle of revenge and anger. This is where forgiveness, especially, and careful listening to others can be God's circuit breaker in a way, of that cycle. You can't fix the other person, but you can refuse to reinforce the cycle by not reacting. So that breaks the circuit, if you like. So some of my electrical background coming through there. But, but only with God's help. 
It's the, the only way it can really make a big change there. So, because of this, and because he's got therefore there, so if you see the word therefore, you've got to wonder what it's there for, as I've been told, you know. It says, therefore, we need to put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, verse 21, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So here we see what the source for the power for the fight comes from. It's not from our own strength, but from God himself. See, it's we receive with meekness the implanted word. It's nothing in ourselves. So this, God, this is God who works in us through the power of his word. And that includes both the truth of the Bible, of course, and then also the incarnate word, Jesus Christ himself, through his spirit. So they're some of the resources we have. But notice also this verse tells us what our default state is. Because James C says there we need to put away filthiness, or what was the word that in the NIV? Um, filth, I think it was, or something like that. And rampant wickedness. And that implies a default state. We have those things in us as, as, as default, as we're born like that. We all start from the same position. So because we're there, we have a choice to make. So it's a choice between these two things. The first one is that we can choose to keep hold of that filthiness that comes from being born into this fallen world. And which, let's be honest, we kind of get used to it. We're sort of, it's because it's all we know, and that, but it hinders our humble reception of God's word. But how does it hinder us? It's because the wickedness that we all like to cling to comes ultimately from Satan and his world and is in direct opposition to God and his kingdom. We can't have both. We can't have both Satan's kingdom and God's kingdom. It's Matthew 6.24 there. You can't serve two masters. So we have that choice of the, we can keep hanging on to the, to the bad instead, but we should focus on the seed of God's word which is sown in our hearts. Uh, upon hearing the gospel, and it's illuminated by the living word, Jesus himself. Um, in that way, we become like good soil. In the, we can't help but think of the parable of the sower in this, this little section here, um, where we produce good fruit, not weeds and rotten fruit. And that word that's implanted can save us. It's, um, it's all the way from the initial repentance of conversion. This is salvation. This is what I'm going to be talking about after this series, salvation. So we've got the initial repentance of conversion through helping us grow in faith onto our ultimate share in Jesus' glory at the end of our natural lives. That's what salvation is. It's the whole thing. And God's word is active through the whole lot. So what we can see then is that in order to produce this good fruit, this think of it like fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace and patience and all those things, and the good works to help other people in need, which James talks about later, um, so in order to do that, we need to spend time being. That is, time with God getting to understand who we are as new creations in Christ. That's the outworking of that truth, um, of that status of God's sons and daughters. That energises our doing. It should do, anyway, if we're not hindering it. Um, at least in doing the things of faith, anyway, which are the works which honour Jesus' name, if we act in faith. Now, since we are, sorry I didn't fill those out, so that's the choices we have. Now, since we are on the topic of being with God and being introspective and so forth, I, I thought I should address something that I've only recently become aware of. Um, it may be a little controversial, we'll see how we go. I hope it sparks some discussions. We'll see how we go. Um, but we've become aware of recently there's a real push by many people and organisations today for this idea of mindfulness. It's, um, it's a form of meditation, depends, there's all different grades, but a form of meditation which we do need to have some caution about, I would argue. So let's, let's just clarify what we're talking about and then we'll see where we are to sort of see how the Bible addresses it. The first place I became aware of it was actually right here in Collie and our kids are actually starting school tomorrow, I think it's tomorrow, at Amaru, yep, at Amaru. And... Um, so I was reading just the website, looking at what the chaplain had on there, and she talks a lot about mindfulness on the school website. And here's her definition. She may have got it from someone else, I'm not sure. But she says, for our new families, which 
got our attention because we're the new, one of the new families. For our new families, mindfulness is the practice of being fully present in the moment with our mind and our senses. It's both intentional and non-judgmental. And there's a couple of other definitions I thought I'd get just to get a rounded view. Another one, um, paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally. That's from John Kabat-Zinn, who's a well-known mindfulness expert. And consciously bringing awareness to your here and now experience with openness, interest and receptiveness. So that's from a guy called Russ Harris, his book called The Happiness Trap. So we can see the main themes here about being intentional in your thoughts, which is definitely a good thing. And having talked to Brahman, who is a teacher at Amaru and seems to this whole process seems to be having success in settling kids and uh, getting difficult students down and focused. And I absolutely support that. And as long as that's all it is, um, uh, as, one pro- as long as that's all it is. But as one progresses in the technique, it's also about being non-judgmental and uncritically open. Now, this is where the alarm bells ring for me. Now, this is obviously my opinion here, and I'm happy to chat with others after, but we'll see how we go. Um, now, mindfulness has some links with Eastern mysticism and Zen Buddhism, and that's certainly something to be, think about. Uh, but let's see what, the, what kind of picture the Bible paints of meditation, and, and we'll compare the two. So first we'll look at the non-judgmental question. Now, just to explain, part of what the more advanced mindfulness practices encourage is for you to let thoughts pass through your mind, without calling them good or bad. You sort of have this stream of consciousness, they sort of just talk a lot. Um, Just let those thoughts be what they are and don't label them. Don't try and intrude, just experience them. But I don't think this is what the Bible teaches us. We're not to hypocritically judge others, that's true. We're not meant to be judgmental hypocritically on other people. But as for whether we should let thoughts have free reign in our minds, I would argue the Bible is fairly clear. So let's look at some... Oh, sorry, I did have the... Oh, sorry, that's the definitions of mindfulness. I slipped behind there. Um, but let's look at what the Bible says. Firstly, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 it says, Take every thought captive to obey Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. So not all thoughts are neutral ones, I would argue. And those which don't meet God's standards are... I like to sort of picture it. You drag, you grab the thought, handcuff it and frog march it to Jesus and say... Is this suitable for you? So you can think of them as a person or a spirit, even with handcuffs on, if you like. And then Jesus can release them or not release them. So this learning to discern is a sign of maturity. And in fact, Hebrews 5.14 says that. Solid food is for... Sorry, I'm a step behind here. Solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained from constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So he's very skilled at putting thoughts across our minds. So how we will spot them, we really can't if we're being uncritical. So instead, John warns us in 1 John 4 verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Paul puts it pretty simply in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, if you... I don't expect you to be able to look all these up, but you can note them down and read them later. But test everything, hold fast to what is good. So hopefully you're with me in the idea that it's pretty reckless to allow our minds to have completely open borders, if you like. Open borders is a bit of a phrase these days. Uh, We need to be open to the possibility of new thoughts, of course. But once they're shown to be willing to live under the king's standards and be obedient to him. I think... A good summary is actually found in Proverbs 4.23. Above everything else, guard your heart, because from it flow the springs of life. Okay, so what should we focus on? So we'll look at the biblical view of meditation. What should we cast our minds on? Because meditation is not wrong in itself. It just needs to have some boundaries. And there's a whole bunch of references in Psalm 119, because that's a big one that focuses on the Word of God. Um, so I'll just pick a couple from there that relate to, being, um, to meditation. So 119 verse 148. 
My eyes are awake before the watchers of the night, that I may meditate on your promise. And then verse 99 also. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. And verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. And there's others as well, obviously. Psalm 1 verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Um, And here's an applicable one as well. Isaiah 26 verse 3. Um, It's the last one in this bit. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So this piece is the real piece that we, we need and we want. So I hope you can see the key difference there between this, this further version of mindfulness and, and other worldly meditation techniques and how God intends it to be. Can you see the difference there? Yeah, we need to be focused on God and his word, letting him change us. Um, other kinds pretty much deny God by making you focus on something within yourself whether it be your own breathing or your own thoughts or whatever, which can't hurt necessarily, but it's not as good as it could be. Um, so it, it is self-focused, it's self-directed, uh, and frankly it's self-absorbed. In fact, some secular analysis of mindfulness meditation uh, that I've been reading comment that it's, it's too much about detaching from reality and from others. This is secular people saying this. Um, so we're, we're part of this world. In order to meet the challenges it throws us, we need to be grounded in reality, and ultimate reality is found in knowing God. So uh, I recommend that we are mindful, absolutely, but mindful of the right things. So if we find that, I would argue, if we have no choice but to participate in mindfulness meditation, what should we do? Well, I think some of the Psalms we read Uh, sorry, just read before, give us um, some good tips. So just have a quick look back at those ones. Um, Firstly, to meditate on God's promises. That's from verse 148. I will never leave you nor forsake you. All things work together for good. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. There's some great promises in the Bible that we can bring with us. So yeah, make your own mental list and, and carry it around with you perhaps. You can think of the promises that God has made. The next one, focus on God's testimonies. You can meditate on them. So maybe the idea of testimony can be his own accounts of what he's done for his people throughout history and the things he's done for you in your life. We have very much to be thankful for. We can also fix our eyes on his ways, as in the ways of living, good, good things to do. So I've sometimes found it helpful to actually mentally rehearse doing things which honour Jesus. So perhaps even resisting temptation, if you have a temptation situation, picture yourself fighting against that. How about witnessing to others? You can um, visualise yourself talking to others. That might give you some bit more confidence to do it when the, when the occasion arises. Of course we can confess sin, um, and we can pray for others, of course, and, and most obviously just meditate on a verse of the Bible while we're sitting there. There's loads of things. So just be aware that counterfeit versions of meditation can be avenues for Satan to get a foothold in our lives. So just be, I thought it would be remiss of me not to, to warn of the dangers, and many people do experience the dark side of it. Um, so I think a good summary of the approach we should take can be found in Colossians, 3, oh sorry, Colossians 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Okay, so I just want to reiterate, school level ones, as far as I can tell, seem not too bad, but it can be steps on from that. So just, just be cautious about any involvement that you, you have. Just be mindful about what God says. Okay, enough about that. If you want to, uh, you can look up the, the short essay that I've given a link for at the bottom of your notes there. Because um, I just found that a bit helpful. Because sort of, not many people are actually talking about it from a Christian perspective. So it's partly why I wanted to address it today. And, and this guy has a fairly balanced look, I think. But overall, I think it's sufficient to say that when we spend time being, that we should be filling our minds with the truth about God. 
um, if we're going to really be changed more into his image. All right, so your time's ticking away. Let's uh, move through the rest of this passage fairly quickly now. And uh, first, what we'll uh, look at is the hearing and doing from verses 22 to 25. So James goes on, he's linking the idea of focusing on the word that's been implanted and that being the driver of our doing. So verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So someone who's a hearer only is someone who might you know, know all the facts and be able to recite all the Bible verses and answer all the Bible quizzes. Um, but in their lives, they live just for themselves. They have an unscrupulous approach to their business, perhaps, and they dabble with sin in their minds. And we all have temptation, but do you let it fester? Do we play with it in our minds like a cat plays with a mouse? And maybe in, in the actions, and if, if once it starts in your mind, it comes into your actions. You can see, all of us are involved in a cycle, whether good or bad. And there's no, not really any middle ground. You're either in one cycle or the other. So the good cycle that we should be looking for um, is one of not just hearing, but listening to the Spirit of God. So we're really investing that time in the relationship that he designed each of us to have with him. And I, I, investing is actually a good word because it's, it costs you something, but it does pay you back in the long run. So we listen to the Spirit of God, his word, through prayer and, and good advice from other trusted Christian people. And the Spirit then empowers us to live life faithfully and make decisions which demonstrate our love for him. That's the way the cycle should work. So this kind of living then encourages us in our faith and drives us back to him in thankfulness and as we seek more guidance um, in, in our lives for him to help us make better decisions in our lives. Now the bad cycle, I'll, I'll leave the good cycle up there on the screen, but the bad cycle is obviously the opposite of that where you have input from the world and like if you only get your information from the mass media or from Hollywood or popular opinion or whatever you read on Facebook, um, which quite often leads to bad decisions and which draw you more into a downward spiral away from God. It obviously is not what we want. So, like I said, we're either in one cycle or the other. Now, often we quickly switch between the two <laughs> and, that, and that's part of the challenge of life, isn't it? Which spiral are we in at the moment? Are we up or down? Now, the, the spiral idea, is that's my illustration, um, but James has his own illustration. If you look at verse 23. So if, if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. Now this is really just a descriptive way of illustrating the kind of person mentioned before who, who you know, knows all the answers, that had answers for Christian questions, but doesn't apply them to his or herself. Um, I've got a quote on your sheet there as well from A.W. Tozer. He's a theologian from sort of mid, early, mid-20th century. He said this, An honest man with an open Bible and a pad and a pencil is sure to find out what's wrong with him very quickly. So a bit of reflection under the light of the word, I think, is the idea there. So otherwise, we're just people who sort of say, oh, yes, I'm a sinner, or yes, Jesus is Lord, but prove by our actions that we believe neither of those things. Because we are sinners and Jesus is Lord. They need to change us. Now, verse 25, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hero who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So this tells us uh, we need to persevere in the practical application of God's truth. We can't just check in with God when it, when it suits us, or just once in a while. Um, if his spirit is living in us, we need to get used to him directing our decisions and our, and our, our lives. So this verse, verse 25, de describes someone who has, uh, um, sorry, this start, uh, describes someone who has a healthy cycle, that's what I'm trying to say, of being and doing. So that's the cycle on the screen there. 
Uh, they start by looking into the law, which is simply a way of saying the Bible, really. Because remember, I said last week he's writing to the 12 tribes, so he's talking mostly to Jewish people. Um, and they obviously deeply reverent of their law, which is our Old Testament. But they start with that, the law and then commit to sticking with God and his word and then they show it in their daily lives. That's the cycle. So God will ensure that such a person will be blessed in what they do. Um, and, you, and you measure that with the fruit that's born. That's the eternal fruit. It's the fruit of character like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc. And the fruit of blessings to others as well. So that includes people who are saved, who become saved through your ministry or whatever. And everyone has a ministry. Um, and it also encourages more time with God um, and obviously in his word as, we, um, as the cycle keeps continuing. And some have even called this verse uh, a summary of the book of James. And I, I think that's not far, far off. It's the idea um, that James has really, he centers his whole book around this, this idea of being and doing and living, living for God. All right, now let's, uh, as we wrap up, talk about true religion, the last couple of verses here. Now, the word religion carries a lot of baggage these days. It's um, often ridiculed because it's come to be associated with too much weird stuff and, uh, and extremism, that's the word for the day, at least in the world's eyes. So um, a lot of people see the wars that come through fighting religious battles and um, and they apply that to all religions and say that, you know, even Christianity is just religion. Um, it just causes too many problems. We should not, not have it. You know, you get rid of religion. It's terrible. Um, now, James uses the word here to tackle that idea, actually. And he says, says this, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. So religion as pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now I think one of the most basic ways to see how you're going spiritually is to, to consider what comes out of your mouth, if, especially if it's a sudden situation and what naturally comes out of your mouth. And sometimes I reflect on that and go, whoops. <laughs> but yeah, we're all, that's one way we can tell. Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, the Bible says. So this is something James gets into more deeply in chapter 3. So we'll look at it more then. But um, we do need to ask ourselves, what are the effects of my words? Do I draw people to God or am I pushing them away from him? Or if you're carrying the name Christian, is your witness honouring to God? Now, it's not just our words, of course, um, because James points out that our actions matter too. Are we thinking of others before ourselves? And the measurement for this, a good way to measure it, is to take note of where your time and your money are spent. Because the Greek word for visit there is, is much stronger than just visit. It means to look after. So are you ensuring the vulnerable and the truly suffering that are within your scope of influence, are they being taken care of? So that, are you spending your time and money in, in ways that help other people? Or is it entirely about entertaining yourself? Yeah, that's, that's a tough question to ask each, each of uh, our own lives. So we certainly can do worse than uh, donating money to the Yaloop Harvey Fire Appeal. Um, and the Churches of Christ Ministry Centre have sort of set, set that up as a possibility for you if you want to help out those guys in Harvey and, and Yarloop. And I was actually speaking this week with the Harvey pastor. His name is Matt Holt. Um, and he was saying that's, that's the best way you can help them at the moment is to, to donate money for that because they're ensuring that the money does go to the right things. So um, that's one way you can, actually, you can really make some difference. Of course, there are many other ways in life um, to, to help people. There are sponsored children. I'm sure a lot of you have sponsored children, probably multiple. That's a good way. If you get a good organisation that the money goes to the right place, so do your research. Um, and also, just having a chat with the untouchables of society. Uh, he goes on about, uh, in 27, James talks about being stained by the world. That's not being stained by the world, just talking to people who other people might re reject. 
So I encourage us to look into, uh, take your opportunities to do that. But being unstained from the world, he says, uh, how do we keep being unstained from the world if it's not by avoiding people like that? Well, the world wants you to ignore God and his standards and be a good little global citizen. You're not to offend anybody and you've got to keep your religion to yourself. But there are way too many people dying and, and the, who don't know Jesus Christ. We can't, we can't accept that, unfortunately. Maybe not unfortunately. We just can't accept that. We have to live out what is in our hearts. So as we be in God's word, he gives us the power to do the work of building each other up, to do the work of evangelism, telling others about Christ, and being God's ambassadors to the world. That's often a good word, ambassadors. So this may offend people at times, but the words of the apostles, in the words of the apostles, we must obey God rather than men. So let's help each other and keep each other on the being and doing cycle, the good one. So yeah, that's, that's my challenge for all of us this week. So let's pray as we finish now. Father, you've given us all the resources we could ever need and we thank you for that. Pray that, help us, that you help us to focus on you and your word in all the distractions of life that we can live lives worthy of the name you've placed on us, Lord. It's a humble, humbling thing to carry the name, your name with us, but it's a great responsibility and Lord, we pray you empower us to do what you have us to do in this world and to, to be good representatives of you, of you, to love, to forgive, and to listen. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>